hello and welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have an interview with Jack Schaefer, head writer for Marvel's WandaVision. It's twilight time. Wanda and Vision. Oh, we have five pets. This is our home now. I want us to fit in. Oh, this is gonna be a gas. Where did you two move from? How long have you been married? And why don't you have children yet? <laughs> our story. I think what my wife means to say is that we moved from... Moved from where? Married when? Damn it, why? Oh, Arthur, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Am I dead? No. Why would you think that? Because you are. couple, you know? Oh, I don't think that was ever in question. <laughs> Jack and guest host Sharday Sellers discussed how Marvel came up with the concept for the show and how Jack got involved in the pitching process, building the writer's room and enforcing a sense of respect, community, and collaboration, the TV shows that shaped her foundation, and more. Check it out. Welcome back to Write On Everyone, it's Sharday here again, and this is going to be the nerdiest episode you'll be listening to forever because I am here with a personal hero of mine from this year, head writer, creator, and EP of WandaVision, Jack Schaefer. Hello, Jack. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. No, I'm... Uh... I'm going to nerd out. I am a huge <laughs> Marvel fan, and I'm, but more importantly, I'm a huge WandaVision fan, which I'm like, who wasn't this year? Like, who didn't like the show? Can I, my first question is, how does it feel to be like the best show all year? Is it great? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wonderful? it's pretty awesome. Now, there are so many amazing shows. So, so, so many. And we can even get into that later because there's lots to talk about. But um, it has been, it has been an incredible ride with this show. And I... I feel elated and grateful and um, honored by all of it, by all of the attention the show has received. And it deserves. I I remember sitting down to watch it on Disney Plus and obviously the first episode, I think everyone was kind of like, what is happening here? Can we go from the beginning? What are the conversations like when you're like, okay, WandaVision, what are we going to do? Like, when did you know that this was going to be the direction you want to head to head down for WandaVision? Yeah, it was so it was Kevin Feige's idea. It was something Marvel develops most of their content in house. So it was something that I was invited to pitch on. And they had, um, you know, they had this idea of Wand and Vision and the history of classic TV sitcoms and using all of that as a way to examine her grief. And especially because like, you know, in the comics, like she has such a long history of loss and hardship. And they sort of they had it kind of in a big document of a lot of different ideas and and different research and and I kind of digested all of that and yeah brought a structure to the table you know I I, I was so dazzled by the idea but I also was like this is not gonna work <laughs> Like, this is crazy. This is going to be, this is going to be a gimmick. Like, how are we going to care about people? Like, that was all sort of my internal anxiety. But the mm -hmm. challenge of it was so irresistible that I, like, immediately set about trying to figure out, well, okay, if, if this is the thing, how do you do it effectively? How do you do it in a way where you actually do care about these characters? Because my fear was like, you know, with superhero stuff, it's already like a little bit at an arm's distance because they're superheroes. And then right. put another arm's length away with sort of like sitcom kind of arch performance and, and stylized worlds. And so I just, I, first I came at it from a way of like, what's the most interesting watch. And for me, that's always when the, you're ahead of the audience for a while and then mm -hmm. sort of blindside them and give them a lot of information and then jerk them in another way and then jerk them in another way. So that was part of my design. And then it was about just remaining true to her authentic journey and, and tethering everything to the love story that like when in doubt, put the focus on the love story of these two like wildly charming and charismatic people. So our listeners are mostly made up of screenwriters and then a couple of like, probably just weirdos, but, um, <laughs> and some, I know weirdo you, some weirdos, 
Uh, yeah, exactly. I know you can't give us the full details of what you pitched, but is there any tips on, on pitching on such a huge piece of IP that you would like people to know to take with them if they ever get in that position? Yeah, well, so pitching at Marvel is very specific. Um, it's different than than at other places. I would say sort of like larger advice on pitching. There's a lot. There's lots that I have to say about that. Pitching is 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 very difficult, and it's a skill that you have to develop over time. And it's it's weirdly counterintuitive because as a writer, you're you don't necessarily have to be a performer, but this is a performance piece. So mm. it is an aspect of screenwriting that is different from being a playwright or being a novelist. Like you have to be able to go into a room and convince everyone in the room with your confidence and with your sort of performative ability that you can tell a compelling story. So I think in pitching it's it's really important to be confident and it's really important to to be entertaining and to to read the room to know when you can skip over details, like even if you have the details, even if you have the answers to all the questions, to have a sense of, okay, I'm losing them a little bit. I'm gonna skip over this part and and like just bridge the gaps in the narrative tissue in order to get to my next thing that's interesting. I think that takes a while to have the sort of confidence to know how to learn, but it's important. And to that end, my sort of general advice is like, try and pitch the thing the way you would pitch to a friend in a bar. Like mm. when you're relaxed, when everything is casual, that everybody knows that feeling of starting a story and the person you're talking to is like, oh my God, what? And you're like, yeah. And then like, you want to cultivate that feeling, even if you're in a cold room that isn't giving you much back, you still want to have that bearing in order to, to sell your wares. Was that even your question, Charday? I can't remember. No, that was, and it was, no, it was <laughs> It was great. No, it was a perfect answer. Thank you. Because I, I, I do yeah. feel like pitching is, I'm confident in my own writing, but pitching, I'm like, I have no idea like what you guys want from me. I honestly, it took me years and I, like, I acted a little bit. It's not like, and I don't have trouble in rooms. I don't have trouble with people. I am clearly an extrovert. Like it, it is, it is such a specific skill set. Um, and it, and I, I, it was late in my career that I, that I feel like I cracked it. So I would also advise all writers to be like gentle with themselves about it because the other, yeah. the flip side of it is like when you're crazy confident, but you don't have the, you know, you don't have the skill to back it up. That's a whole other mess that you get yourself into. Some people are really, really good at that. Men, for example, just kidding. <laughs> I'm <not doing> that. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> um, let's, let's skip ahead and get into the writers and were you able to choose your own writers for the show? Oh my gosh, I was. And I did, that's the best work I did on the show was selecting my writers. No joke. It, it was my first time putting a room together. It was one of my very favorite steps of the process. Um, it was my producer, Mary Lovanos and me, you know, reading people and bringing people in and having our meetings. And we were really diligent about it. It was very important. I had, I had a number of like it, uh, this is going to be the rest of the podcast, by the way, Chardonnay. Yes. It's like, I, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> I, you know, I had a lot of, I had a lot of priorities, you know, I, you know, I had, I, I had, a, I didn't have any room experience of my own. I'd never been a staff writer in a room, but I had been an assistant sort of around rooms and always found the environment to be very intimidating. And I, I, it was really important to me to cultivate an atmosphere of, you know, safety and, um, everyone has a voice and of respect community and collaboration and um what? And that's not tv i know <laughs> i mean it should be right like <laughs> yes it should be and and i i just i didn't want you know i i had plenty of experiences in my career where i felt i was you know i felt small and i felt exposed and i felt sweaty and nervous and and you know that's unavoidable in anyone's path in any career to have those difficult moments but I just, I wanted to have fun. And I, uh, my, the way my husband, husband said it to me, and he's so right, is he was like, you are selecting eight people to metaphorically get in a van with you and travel across the country. Yep. <laughs> so those people better be cool humans and kind humans and good at their jobs. So anyway, so that was really, that was so important. And then, you know, representation in the room was vital and we were very, you know, cognizant and, and demanded a lot of scripts of women and people of color and queer writers. And that is life in 2021. That is the mission. And then I needed like, I needed like this crazy 
toolbox of a room. I needed people who could do genre and people who knew comics and people who know sitcom and people who know world building and mythology mm-hmm. and people who know procedurals. And like, and so it was just this incredibly, I, I wanted, what I wanted more than anything was, was for like people to look at the IMDb page of the writers and be like, what is the show? <laughs> <laughs> Mission yeah. accomplished because what, I mean, first episode, you're like, what is this show? Yeah. Um, and yeah. then it blossoms to this beautiful flower. I want to ask, I have a reason to ask it. So I, I promise you, I'm not trying to steal your identity, but where are you from? Where did you grow up very quickly? I was, I was born in New York, but moved very quickly. And I moved around a lot all over the country until I was about eight. And then I grew up outside of LA. Interesting. And I'm asking because I'm from Michigan. My mother is an immigrant from Belize, from Central America. And the one thing that we have in common is television. I grew up watching the shows that you're referencing on your show. Believe uh-huh. it or not, as a young Black girl living in Michigan, I remember being stuck to Nick at night and watching I Love Lucy and watching, gosh, the genie, I uh, Dream of Dreamy. And uh, then- I Dream of yeah. Dreamy, Bewitched. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Bewitched. Uh-huh. And then I know. To, I- it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's, I mean, I, like, I, I didn't know how much sitcom knowledge I had until I dug into this. And then I realized, yeah, I was watching Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. And like, I even caught like Hogan's Heroes. Like they were all of these shows that were just already like inside my cells and I didn't realize it. And like, I, you know, I, I come from a very close knit family and, and like my, you know, my parents were very present in my life, but I still spent an inordinate amount of time in front of the television Same. and specifically syndicated television. Yes. So yeah, I had, I had all that. Were you, was the question about where I'm from? Were you imagining I was also from Michigan? Cause that's fun. <gasps> no, I just wanted to point out that we are live two separate lives. Oh, correct. And, and, correct. And, and television. And we have this friends. uniting. Yeah. Yeah. We all have this foundation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it, it working with um, Kevin Feige is, is wonderful in a lot of ways, but like, but he really is that sort of walking pop culture person who Mm. just has almost like wears it as a suit, like all of those sort of references. And it, it was on this project in particular, it was so fun to be constantly speaking that language. It, it's, you feel like you're sort of recognizing someone else across a divide when you both have the same sort of fandom for a specific television show. No, I, I totally get that. I mean, I moved out here when I was 19. I live in Burbank now and coming from Michigan, it's, it's automobile country. My mom works in automotive as a recruiter. So no one, you know, there is a small community of film but it's not like it out here. And I remember the first job I ever got out here just being on a set and everyone's just talking about movies. You f- I felt at home. I was mm. like, these are my people. Yeah. <laughs> these are the topics I've wanted to talk about. Yeah. I mean, it's honestly not to get like too deep, but it's, it's why I do what I do. I do feel like there's a great, like the, the connective power of entertainment is, is so powerful and so beyond. And, you know, the way that WandaVision premiered in the moment moment that it did I mean yeah it felt like being inside of an enormous hug like an enormous internet electric hug Um, it felt like TGIF uh, TGIF is finally back which like (laughs) I have brothers that are 16 they're Gen Z they don't know about TGIF what is that (laughs) Like, oh, we're going out. And I'm like, no, we used to sit, me and my, we used to sit around the TV and watch yeah. these shows together as a family. And I, you know, I was separated from my sister during pandemic. So I was watching them through the Disney, like watch along app with her, which is, you can I watch know. it. I, like, is that, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. But like that I, we were all craving that so much. I mean, I watched it with the writers and there were too many of us to do the group watch. So we would do like a three, two, one click. Yes, yes. <laughs> watch it all together. <laughs> the old and school we would like way. one person would be, yeah, old school, right? But it, yeah, I mean, the and yeah, that TGIF thing is, is so precious. You know, I, I would get like, as the week would go on between shows, I would get a little squirrely because people were demanding more and I would get nervous that I wasn't satisfying fans. But then I would think, no, this is part of the fun, the weight. And the anticipation is is something that we've been missing and something that we need in order to like kill time right now, especially when we're not allowed to leave our homes. 
Were you just going through all of the tweets? Because you'll see a lot of mine in there because I guessed so wrong. Like I look back at it now <laughs> and I was like, I know how this show is going to end. I know what they're doing. And I was wrong. <laughs> a lot of us were just plain wrong. Was it fun to look at them? And go, it was. I mean, it gave me a little anxiety because I was like, oh gosh, you know, we're going in this, they're going in this direction. We're not going there. But it was, it was mostly really fun. I mean, at the end of the day, it was just like, I have never experienced or even borne witness to that level of fan engagement. Um, and I was I, like, you know, when I was a kid and and my sort of like biggest dreams of success, it was never, you know, millions of people on their yeah. phones, on an app, real time responding. Like I, my stupid little brain couldn't conceive of anything like that. I was just hoping to get a film in a theater at some point. So <laughs> it, it was totally overwhelming, like, and validating beyond a point. Like it just, I, I was just sort of standing in awe. And every, every Thursday night felt like Christmas Eve. Like I would just crawl into oh my bed. My, my husband would be like, what do you think they're going to say? <laughs> well, it's so funny because the people that got to watch it like Thursday right at midnight, I was like, I could never do that because I had to work. So I always waited till Friday night when I had my time and I would have to avoid Twitter because they are so rude and they would I spoil know. it. I <laughs> know. So mad at Twitter. Them. Twitter. Twitter. Um, <laughs> as 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 you know, the show wrapped up and 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 you got to see everyone's reactions and and then all the pressure came off. What would you say was the highlight of the season for you to actually either watch um, by proxy or when you were actually shooting the show? Well, so, so there were a couple, um, big moments with the show airing. One was Evan Peters. That was something that a secret that I had been, you know, white knuckling for over a year, kind of a year and a half. So that was a big deal. And there was some online, like sort of spoiling of it, you know, a few months prior, but it didn't get a lot of notice that did land. It landed with a, with a bigger thunderclap than I was expecting. Cause I didn't expect, you know, this amount of response. So, so that was really exciting. And like, I, I, I sort of can't really explain what a big deal it was. Cause I, 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 not since I was a kid, was I waiting, you know, so long for something to happen. Yeah. Um, so that was very exciting. And he just did such a great job on the show. And all of that was, was really wonderful and satisfying the whole time. I was just waiting for the last two episodes because I knew that no one would be able to anticipate what we were going to do, mm -hmm. but I believed that it would be emotionally satisfying. You know, I knew in my heart the whole time, specifically the penultimate episode, Laura Donnie's episode, you know, it was always so beautiful to me. And, and I had faith that it would really resonate kind of beyond all of the Easter eggs and the fan theories. And so when that one dropped and, and it did seem to move audiences, that that was really very special. What was your reaction to hearing that it was Agatha all along is going number one on like Spotify <laughs> and iTunes. Well, honestly, honestly, my reaction was, how did I not anticipate this? Because, <laughs> right. because I'm like, because you, you've got, you've got Catherine Hahn and you've got, you know, Bobby and Kristen and, and their enormous body of work and their track record. Like you put those things to, and then Marvel. So you put those things together yeah, that's going to track on iTunes like higher than Justin Bieber. Yeah. And what, what else is going to happen? <laughs> it's no, so great. It totally blew my mind. And it was, was so funny watching TikToks and memes of dance oh with it. And trap remixes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, those just are my favorite. Those are my favorite. Bananas, bananas, bananas. But it just and all the the Catherine Hahn love. Oh my gosh, yeah. she's uh, she's sensational, and she's always been sensational. But yes, I I mean, and I want to ask you this. Um, it's a standard woman question, you guys. I'm sorry. There is a lot of female power behind the camera and in front of the camera. What makes this set different for your actors? Was it because you you are a woman and they were able to trust you to maybe take themselves a little bit differently than before? Because this is the first time I've seen Catherine Hahn in this kind of way. I feel like mm -hmm. she was more exposed, honestly, through this character of Agatha that I've never seen her. And Lizzie too. Um, wow. What a, she had to reach some peaks and valleys, man, that. Yeah. No, she, she really, 
I, she just, Lizzie just attacked this role in all the ways, in the sort of technique of it, the physicality, the sitcom type of acting, and then, you know, going all the way there with the emotion. She, she, she left nothing on the table Yeah, that Lizzie Olsen. Yeah, you know, Catherine, of course, like anyone who has even a limited awareness of the entertainment industry understands inherently how special and how revered Catherine Hahn is. And it, you know, it was only a matter of time until she became a global, like bona fide phenomenon. I mean, I didn't dare dream that she would take this role. You know, we wanted a Catherine Hahn type, like, but that wasn't going to actually happen. You know, <laughs> she wouldn't deign, like, so, like that kind of, you know, thespian royalty wasn't going to deign to do our <laughs> silly little show. And, and yeah, we got so lucky that she, it, I think it was a kind of right place, right time. She had taken a meeting at Marvel and the door was kind of open for, she, I think there was interest on her side to maybe explore the universe and and the, it just it just lined up so beautifully and I can't imagine it any in any other way she she is Agatha Harkness what uh this might be a little heavy question so feel free to skip it but what does grief mean to you just in general but also in terms of the show what are you sure. trying to say about grief uh, gosh, if you can believe this, no one has asked me that. It's the women. I know, right? <laughs> no, the best questions do do come from the ladies. Um, what? Uh, uh, gosh, I'm I'm flummoxed by that. I that question. I have all my sort of canned responses to so many things, and that one is really deep. I mean, it, the first thing I think of is is this past year, the enormity of all of our collective grief. And, and this is, this is a, like a terrible show. I hope it doesn't make me seem shallow, but we had this incredible show debut and it had this huge, you know, response and all of the people that I love on this show that I feel deeply committed to, I could not see them. I could not be with them in, in the celebration of the moment. And it sort of, it felt like this huge kind of nesting dolls of of layers of beautiful things and really heartbreaking things which is you know kind of the show in itself so i mean i i i think i think that that's my sort of connection to grief and to this show is is the idea that it that it's a loss but the loss always highlights something else beautiful yeah. i got to give then, you credit wait, because you didn't quote your own show. You could have said grief is love preserving. And I would have been like, I take it. I accept it. It's Yeah, it's- I try not to I try not to quote my own work when I when I can. It's tempting sometimes because because I'm like, well, I worked hard on that line. I'll just say it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Um, I only have one question left. I have, I have a thousand, I could talk to you all day, but I only have one question left. And it's a question we ask all of our guests. And what advice would you give your younger writer self? Oh my gosh. So my younger writer self, I mean, the, the first thing I would do is just kind of hold her hand and say, it's, it's okay. And you can stop being so mean to yourself. (laughs) (laughs) That would be the first thing. And then I would, then the second thing I would say is you're going to still be mean to yourself, but, but I'm here to hold your hand. And I would say like it, it, it with writing, it takes a really long time to become good at it. And it requires life experience. I just, I just would have told myself to kind of go easy on myself and, and be, you know, be a student of the world as much as possible. I love that advice. Be kind to yourself is something we could take, not just as writers, but in in general, give yourself grace. Life is hard, especially during this pandemic. Really give yourself grace. I mean, (laughs) yes. I also have to congratulate you. Aren't you a popcorn winner? A golden popcorn stop? I know. Isn't that amazing? I can't believe that. My 12-year-old self is losing her mind. I can't believe it. I've been like, my best friend, she's been my best friend since um, freshman year of high school. And I've been like, just fear seriously texting her about it. And, and in, <laughs> in Lizzie's speech, she quoted, you gotta be, you gotta be the song that does. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Which, which was an anthem for my best friend and me when we were in high school. So, so my best friend, Claire, hi, Claire. Um, I don't know she's got four kids. She doesn't have time to listen to this. But, um, she texted me and she was like, did you put Lizzie up to this? And I wanted to be like, yes, I did. But it was just a freaky coincidence. It sort of brought the whole thing full circle that my, yeah. my young self and the joy that I felt at, at being the recipient of a golden popcorn was commemorated 
obliterated by the immortal words of Desiree. It was perfect. No, and that's perfect full circle moment as a full circle here as we're winding down the podcast. Thank you, Jack, so much. This was amazing. I have a, I will just tweet all my questions at you from now on. So, so please look out for please. me. I, I am not a tweeter myself, but you can get my email and I'll answer any question you have. This has been it's so fun. At <laughs> Marvel's number one fan underscore tacos <laughs> rule that's my handle so look out for that <laughs> got it i will look i will that is not that is not easy to miss i got yes. it <laughs> thank you all so much for listening you can still watch wandavision on disney plus right now if you haven't seen it go watch it if you've seen it before watch it again it's fantastic thank you so much i'll see you guys next time Thanks to Jack Schaefer for being on the show. And as always, thanks to Friday Sellers for killing it as a host. You can watch WandaVision right now on Disney+. Plus. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you like this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Mm-hmm.